Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to lecture 6a. In this lecture we're going to be discussing exterior finishes and concrete. So a lot of this is coming from the Understanding Construction Drawings textbook, 4th edition, and the CMHC uh, reference uh, book to uh, residential construction. So in this uh, lecture, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking at all the different finishes that you see in uh, residential construction. There's a lot of different ways that we can uh, finish the envelope uh, of our building. And the envelope is sort of the separation between conditioned space and unconditioned space, or if you want, inside and outside. And so we'll be looking at those separations and the different types of materials that are used and some of the things that are thought about and practice during construction. We'll also talk about a number of uh, NBC and OBC, National Building Code, Ontario Building Code uh, requirements as we go through this. Another related topic that we bring into this um, lecture is concrete. And we're going to cover this fairly lightly because you do get it in depth uh, in a number of areas. Um, but from a residential construction technology perspective, what's involved with it, uh, some of the basics of uh, finishing concrete. And I also give a YouTube reference uh, to a video where it's, you know, the concrete's actually finished. And you can see some of the uh, expertise that is required in finishing it properly. I think the video actually makes it look a lot easier than it is, having done a fair bit of finishing of concrete myself. Um, it is kind of a combination of science and art, if you will. So we'll start off with brick veneer and uh, in certain geographical locations brick veneer is a very very popular finish. Uh, brick veneer just means that you have a single white and a white is one strip of bricks on the exterior of the building. It also means that it's not the structural part of the building so it's there for aesthetics and it's there to protect against uh, wind and weather uh, penetrating through um, the building. And so we'll, we'll discuss some of the elements of that, including things such as uh, the airspace that we keep as a separation between the brick and the interior framing, uh, which is uh, a space one inch minimum according to the building code or 25 millimeters. Uh, that's left and we call it an airspace because it allows air to circulate between the brick and the framing members uh, which um, carry a moisture barrier of some point and better term than a moisture barrier would be a, a building uh, paper or a Tyvek type paper to name a company, uh, air barrier uh, that might be on the exterior surface if it's applied in that way, uh, something that's to protect moisture penetration in behind into the framing members. That's what you want to ensure that doesn't happen. So the airspace allows that space for any moisture that gets in to be able to get out. Very important principle uh, when we're talking about our uh, exterior finishes. You know, we can't have what we call a perfect barrier. Uh, at some point, moisture may get in and if we've designed things properly, it won't cause any problems and it'll be able to dry out. And that's really the way that we should uh, approach our exterior finishes. Uh, brick veneer has thousands of feet of joints and sooner or later some of those joints are going to allow some moisture to um, penetrate through the brick veneer. One of the good things about this system is though that if it does, it has a mechanism to get out, to dry out, and that's why it's such a good exterior finish to use. And it's very, very popular finish in certain areas, both historically and, and currently. Um, there's lots of different patterns that traditionally we used to use in brick veneer that would give it kind of a, a different look and a lot of those patterns were used when we instead of using brick veneer we use solid masonry. So solid masonry is typically a wall that has more than one white. So if we have two whites or three whites of brick uh, we had to tie them together and way back uh, 120 years ago uh, very often we would not have metal Me mechanisms to bond the brick together to tie the whites together. So what we would do is we would reorient some of the bricks so that they would cross over the multiple whites and that would strengthen the wall. So some of those patterns uh, that you'll see in more uh, historical buildings would be like a Flemish bond or an English bond. And you know these are header courses so when you look at this you see 
Um, that's a header is the end of the brick. All right, so the brick is turned perpendicular to the wall. So that would be crossing two twice a brick, which would be tying the wall together. Uh, so in a running bond, you don't see any headers. In a stack bond, you don't see any headers. Well, stack bond is really uh, for aesthetics or decorative purposes. It's definitely not a very strong wall. And in order to make it strong enough to work, we have to put metal in the actual coursing. So usually every several courses, they will have a metal track, which is about a, an eighth to a quarter of an inch rod that is welded together with some cross rods that is galvanized that sits in the mortar and that stops it from cracking vertically. Otherwise, this would be just a mess. So um, something like a stack bond would have a metal bonding placed in it. We, we tend to call it, we used to call it block lock or um, brick lock and basically you just put the tracking in and that would um, strengthen the joints. Uh, at George Brown College, our college, uh, our C building has stack bond blocks everywhere and it was a special architectural block that was manufactured for, for that purpose and every second course of blocks they have a metal track that runs through it to give it strength so it doesn't crack vertically. And so usually in brick, it would be more, it would be um, about every, it depends on the height of the brick. So I don't want to really say exactly how many courses, but say every three or four courses, you would have a horizontal track that would strengthen it if you were doing stack bond. A running bond is what we typically uh, use with a veneer. So we just lap the brick over each other and it has tremendous strength, the lapping over a brick. So that strengthens the wall considerably. So unlike stack bond, it does not need any kind of metal reinforcing in those joints, in the horizontal joints. What it does need is brick ties to tie the brick to the structural wall. So if our structural wall is um, wood frame members, then there would be a sheathing over it and we would either nail or screw the brick ties to the sheathing through to the stud because it needs to be into something solid and then that would bend out into the joints. And usually we would put them every six courses, all right? Building code has specific requirements with regards to area, so it depends on the height of the courses. Uh, but um, the location of the brick ties, uh, usually every six course and usually on every stud. Uh, and again, it depends on the spacing of the studs because it's an area calculation. Uh, so English cross bond, as you can see, it's got a header course every second course, a very strong bond. Flemish bond has a header every second brick. So you go header and this when it's a brick is laid out this way, it's called a stretcher brick. So you go header, stretcher, header, stretcher, header, stretcher, and then they lap on the next course. It gives a very nice kind of cross pattern to it that can be very decorative and sometimes in historical buildings, you'll see the, the cross pattern kind of stand out um, really nicely. In, in Toronto, we have a lot of older structures that have both either Flemish bond or English bond that you'll see. You typically won't see it in new buildings because it's too expensive to do solid masonry buildings. If it's an addition onto maybe an older building that has a Flemish bond, they'd probably do it with a veneer and they would snap the header. So on the outside, it'll look just like Flemish bond, but it'll just have brick ties to the, the wood frame members um, if we're doing it today, just because it doesn't really make sense to do solid masonry houses anymore because then we'd have to put insulation on the inside and we'd have to frame that up. So what's the point? Here's a good example of a Flemish bond garden wall. Uh, so this is right across the street from Casa Loma in Toronto, one of our famous uh, castles. And you can see we've got the stretcher brick, we've got the header brick, and it's a little bit different colorization, so it stands out um, really nicely. These are what we call queen's closures. It works out very often when we do um, a true Flemish blonde, these little um, quarter header or half headers that are put um, perpendicular, tie the wall together, and it gives a, a kind of nice effect. So a queen's closure is that. You also see queen's closures on English bond as well. When we talk about brick veneer, uh, we have to think about weather. And we, when we think about exterior finishes and we think about concrete, we have to think about weather. Anytime you use mortar, 
uh, and mortar is what fills in the joints. So that's all your joints, your vertical joints. We call those the head joints and the horizontal joints. We call those the bed joints. Uh, that's used with a Portland cement mix. We actually call it masonry cement. And the Portland cement is the material that um, gives the mortar its strength. And so what differentiates mortar from concrete is there's additives that are put in to plasticize the mix, to make it more, make more spreadable and to make it better bond with the brick, the mortar. Um, so the plasticizer are usually an extra lime mix that's added to it or similar material that makes it much more workable for the, the masons when they're laying the bricks. But core ingredient is Portland cement, which means Portland cement works when you add water, you have Portland cement, you have that lime mix, which is making it the masonry, uh, masonry um, mix, and then you're adding aggregates. And in the case of brick laying, you'd be adding a brick sand. Brick sand is a pretty fine sand because you don't want any big pebbles in the sand because then you wouldn't be able to set the bricks properly. So it's basically been sieved out at a very sort of fine rate and that'll work very well um, with the masonry cement, but because it has water in it, water freezes. So if we're working in cold weather, then that will cause problems. I'll freeze the mortar. And if the mortar freezes when it's setting up, it'll lose all of its strength. Well, a lot of its strength. It depends how badly it freezes, how fast it, how fast it unfreezes for how much damage has been done. So the building code requires that uh, new brickwork be kept at a temperature of 5 degrees Celsius for a period of 40, 48 hours after it's set. What that typically means is in cold weather, like this image shows, it would have to be in fully enclosed. There would have to be uh, heat that's placed in it. And they have these salamander heaters that release the, the heat into the area. And they would have to keep that area in here, like around here that I believe when I took this picture, it was probably around... Oh, minus 15 degrees Celsius out. So it was pretty cold, but they had it well sealed, well heated. And um, it's a good builder that was doing this. It was Mattamy Homes and they had it well, well enclosed. Um, I've been called in as an expert witness on a couple of cases. And one was where it wasn't heated and you could see cracks appearing in the joints, like in a lot of places. And then what I, I couldn't understand was I could just take my fingernail and I could dig out the mortar with my fingernail wherever I went. And so then I, I did a little bit of investigative work and I found out that um, the masonry work was done in January. Well, you know what, some Januaries, maybe you could have got, you know, two, three days and it was plus nine, plus 10 or whatever outside. But I checked Environment Canada and I saw that that particular January, there was no day that was really above zero. It was a really cold January. And I also found out that they never enclosed it and they never heated it. So it was not, uh, or if they did, it certainly didn't uh, work at, right when it was being laid. So what happened was the whole facade of the house, because it was, it was a court case, the whole facade of the house ended up having to come off all the brick veneer, and then you had to redo it. Well, taking it off, the brick were damaged, so you had to put new brick. It was already landscaped all the way around and fencing, and you had to work around all those things. This kind of event caused so much extra cost. If they had just done it right in the first place, they wouldn't have had to deal with that um, issue. You know, so sometimes I feel like some, some trades feel they can get away with it a few times. Maybe the sun hit it right enough, and it was not. It was more borderline of being... Um, three degrees Celsius maybe or two degrees Celsius and they get away with it but when it hits and it's really cold and it drops and the mortar doesn't have time to set up it's a it's a horrible thing to happen and so the best thing is to follow the building code requirements be safe rather safe than sorry um, with that incident and if you're managing projects don't let somebody tell you oh we do it all the time big mistake okay so uh, better answer would be, well, then you've been doing it wrong all the time. Uh, stretcher is when it's horizontal. Header is crossing the, the weiss. Um, soldier is vertical. 
and roll lock is when it's turned on its side. These are standard names for brick positions. So you'll see on drawings, they'll say a soldier course, or they might say a header course. They might say a roll lock. Rarely do they say a stretcher, but that's what it is. Like the normal placement of a brick is a stretcher. There are two other placements. If you take a soldier and you turn it this way, so instead of like that, it's turned that way and standing up, it's called a sailor. And if you turn uh, this uh, roll lock, you turn it sideways so the flat wide part is out, they call it a shiner course. You really don't see that in North America. When I've gone to Asia and China, I've seen a lot of shiner courses of um, brickwork done and um, uh, sailor courses, but we don't really see it too much in North America or Europe. So um, those are the four key positions that you will run in. We used to have a little running joke that if uh, the bricklayers uh, went out to lunch and had a little bit too much to drink, you look at the soldiers and they're not straight, they're drunken soldiers. Not good, it doesn't look good. Decorative parts of the building are supposed to be nice and vertical. You can tell if you look carefully when brickwork has been done really, really well. It's one of those crafts that it's, it's part art when you actually develop those skills and you get really good at it. And I've, um, I've had the good uh, fortune of working with some very artistic bricklayers over the years. So when you lay the coursing uh, of brickwork into um, a wall, this would be, so this windowsill here, that would be a row lock course that's put into the windowsill. It's sloping, by the way, I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend that you put a precast concrete sill or natural stone sill, but I wouldn't recommend a roll lock. Why? Why do you think? What would that be exposed a lot to? It would be exposed to a lot of rain and in freeze-thaw cycles, rain freezes. Uh, some of those joints might open up and you get a little bit of freeze-thaw going and over 20 years, this starts to deteriorate if it gets enough. If you have a big roof overhang, probably not a problem. Little roof, roof overhang could be a problem. So uh, precast concrete would be one strip. It might have one joint in the middle if it's a wide window or it wouldn't have any joints. And so now any water that falls on it, as long as it's sloping to the outside, will fall to the outside. And a precast uh, sill that has a little cut on the bottom, we call it a drip, about three quarters of an inch back, stops any water from coming across and back towards the brick. Um, so uh, that would be a, a better condition. But this, you see it all the time. And you know, I, for a long time, I hadn't seen it. I didn't notice that it, it's changed in the building code or anything. So you can still do it as far as I've checked recently. Building codes always change. Uh, but uh, I did see a few builders using it recently. For most, I see precast concrete. It's quicker to put in, too. So that's another reason why it's more adopted with builders. It's quicker to put in. You put in a long strip, you're done. You don't have to put in all these bricks. The steel lintels, if any of you had any doubts earlier from uh, what we talked about when we talked about lintels and how lintels are shown in a lintel schedule on the drawings, uh, in my video 5C, I kind of go through the brick drawings and I mention lintels. Well, this is it. That's the steel lintel. It's sitting in this spot and then it has to have a bearing capacity. So depending on your building code, uh, I find that the national building code in some provinces, they differ. Uh, it could be somewhere between 90 and 150 um, millimeters, what the bearing capacity is for the steel lintel. Um, so the bearing capacity is how much it sits on the wall. Best practice is not to have it only sit 90 millimeters because then it could be sitting where there's a joint. It's better that it bridges that joint onto the next brick so that that load is being more distributed across. Uh, so that lintel carries the weight of the brick over top. And this is just illustrating, that, you know, this should be a broken line here. This is just illustrating what it looks like. This goes all the way across to the other side and rests and bears on the other side. So you have to make sure you think those terms. And that is what's bridging across there. So across windows, door openings, they're using uh, either solid masonry or, well, or brick veneer. There's gonna be some sort of lintel or there's gonna be an arch, a masonry arch. 
stack of lintels here going ready for uh, construction so they're already pre-cut uh, to different sizes so they can easily be put into the subdivision. So different joints, a lot of different mortar joints available. Uh, these are the, the typical ones that you see. The most popular concave joint. Uh, very quick to do and very, very durable. Uh, when the mortar, once it's cleared off by the brick mason, uh, they tool the joint with a concave jointer. It just looks like a curved pipe that's a little bend in it that they just go like this. They do all the vertical joints first and then they do the horizontal joints. The mortar should be about fingerprint hard when they do it because that way it'll crumb and not smudge. And uh, the other one that's just about just as good is the V-joint. The only problem with the V-joint is it's a little hard to make it look nice where they intersect, whereas this is a little bit quicker and easier to do. But both are compressing. When you're compressing the mortar on the surface, that helps to seal the surface against moisture penetration. Uh, weather joint, not bad. It does, you know, moisture would um, run off of it. So not a bad joint. It's more a historic type of joint. So you're not going to see it too often. Uh, flush joint is just a cutoff joint where it's not tooled. You see that in some older houses as well. Not as good as a concave joint because it's not compressed. Struck joint, I don't know why you would do that. Like you're leaving a ledge there for mortar to sit on. Why? Uh, it doesn't even look that good. Extruded joint, this is like, I'm, as I sit here right across the street, my neighbor has extruded joint on their brickwork. It gives a kind of colonial look. It was kind of popular, I think, in the 50s, 60s, early 70s. You see it in the odd neighborhood here or there. Most of you wouldn't recognize it until now. And then if you walk around and you got, you're a little bit alert to these things, you'll start to see some of the different types of mortar joints. You might say, oh, that looks kind of rough. It gives kind of a rough kind of countryish look to it. Uh, actually, it's very hard joint to do. Um, the mason has to squeeze the mortar out and leave it, not tool it and touch it. Well, if you're a mason and you've been doing hundreds of thousands of bricks, very hard to remember not to, to not to tool it when you squish the, the brick down and have a enough excess that it kind of leaves it sticking out a little bit. Um, so it's kind of challenging that way when you got such a habit built into doing another way. A rake joint is a recess joint. Very nice looking, gives nice shadow lines. Sometimes in the front of a house, they'll do a rake joint because it looks so nice. Not as durable as a concave joint, so hopefully you've got a pretty good roof overhang. Never do this on a chimney because it's going to wear out much, much quicker because it's fully, a chimney is the weak link uh, because it's fully exposed on all sides. Uh, but these days for our furnaces and that, we really don't have to do chimneys. It's only if we want to have a wood burning fireplace that we, uh, a solid masonry chimney that we need in those cases. Um, so it's not as frequent as it used to be. Uh, this is nice for fireplaces inside, for stonework, natural stone outside. Stone is such a durable product in most cases. Um, the moisture issue is not, not a big issue. And plus it makes it, gives really nice shadow lines to um, the stonework. Uh, but not as durable. So when we, when we talk about that, moisture sits there, absorbs in, you get freeze-thaw cycles, and then over time it causes problems. Brick is a very resilient material, so it takes time before it does deteriorate. But why not have the brick last 100 years? Like If you do a nice joint, it can last a long, long time. Masonry arches. A lot of different arches that you can uh, choose from. These are This is some of the terminology. We're starting to see this with our roofs, uh, rise, uh, our rise, our span, right? Um, really, these are, that's the depth of the arch, the crown, um, major spring line going through the middle. So this is just terminology that you'll see with masonry arches. The bricks that go in an arch, we call them voussoirs. Uh, then that's just the name. Any brick that's in an arch is called a voussoir. Uh, it spreads load, so you can see where basically the spring lines come across, and then this puts a lot of pressure. So if you had a, a arch and it was a wide span arch and it was near the corner of a building, you could have a problem where it's enough pressure over time that it starts to shift out the brickwork on the corner of the building. So you have to have enough mass at the sides of the arches to be able to support um, the load that's being spread outward um, from the actual arches. And this would be what we call a segmental arch, an arch that's really just a Roman arch that the top is cut off of. 
so we've got Garth, Gothic arches, um, Roman arches, um, segmental arches, elliptical arches. These are all uh, popular uh, type arches that you will see in construction. Uh, this you see obviously in uh, your churches and there's different styles of Gothic arches. There's a lancet arch, a drop arch uh, that you'll see in Gothic construction. Well, the Colosseum in Rome, uh, lots of Roman arches there. So you kind of see where the history comes from. Segmental arches give a nice look to a building. You got the arch and then of course you don't need the, um, the steel lintels that we were just talking about. They're not necessary because the arch can take care of that. There are flat arches where traditionally even every brick in the arch was cut to specific angles so that on a flat arch which had just the barest of rise it could actually span a fair distance. Um, today in the building code you would have to put a steel lintel um, to satisfy that requirement. So example of an elliptical arch uh, and in case this is a precast stone that's put into place and then the brick is filled in uh, around it, there's ties of this stone that tie to the wall behind it, metal ties uh, that tie um, that, and there should be some metal ties that fasten this brick also to um, this um, nice sort of uh, precast stone surround on the arch. And then you see a soldier course that's going up along the bottom, and you can see actually there's a stone precast stone still that's going along on the first uh, sort of band all the way around the building, not just as a sill, but they did line it up with the sill and it actually bands around the whole building as a for decorative purposes. There's all kinds of different ways that brick can be installed. And if you're walking around in your neighborhood, start paying attention to it and they'll jump out at you. Uh, you'll really start to notice some of the different features of uh, the look and how it, how it looks. And if it's done well, it can look really nice. If it's done poorly, it looks awful. Uh, so you can even read up a little bit on, uh, on the history of architecture and some of the different uh, types of arches. And what we used to typically do was we always tapered the cuts of the brick. What they tend to do today is instead they taper the joints. So the joints go from a little bit wide to narrow and the bricks then don't have to be cut. If it's a wide enough arch, it looks okay. But if it's a not too wide, the joints look too wide in some spots and narrow in some spots. So the nicest arches are the ones that were hand cut and you can tell that they just all go towards a um, center point. Like an elliptical arch would have a center point somewhere in this area, a three centered elliptical arch, and then it'd have another another center point down there for this portion of the arch and then another center point somewhere around here for this point. So there's a calculation and layout methodology that you do use for um, these types of arches. Weep holes. Uh, so these are weep holes and that's to allow for um, the, the brick space to the air to flow in. So every third brick typically is left as a weep hole at the base separation between the concrete and um, the framing members. So behind this is the sill plate, there's a one inch air space and you've got the framing members, you've got the weep holes in here. Uh, if it's a apartment building, a condominium building and it's brick, you'll see weep holes on the bottom and vent holes on the top at every floor. So from the base floor to the first top of the first floor, you'll see a weep hole and a vent hole. They look the same. It's just the one that's on the upper part of the floor is called a vent hole. The lower one's on the weep hole and the vents to allow air to flow through. In residential, we low rise residential, we don't do that because the airspace goes all the way up into the soffit area and the soffit is vented. So there's a good flow of air. So the whole top portion of the wall is pretty much vented. Um, so there's no issue there. Uh, so don't get the bright idea uh, if your brother-in-law or something decides they want to fill all their um, mortar holes, uh, true story, but um, you don't want to do that, right? You want to leave that vented so that air can flow into, that's usually what every homeowner, why they leave this open and they want to fill it. Uh, in better uh, circumstances, uh, the build, they don't have to, but they will insert like a rubber sleeve that's got little holes in it that allows air to flow into um, the vent space. Uh, and that also prevents, you know, wasps from making nests and things like that. That's usually one of the more irritating things that can occur. 
Uh, so that allows the air to flow in. You have this not only at the base, you'll have it underneath window sills so that any moisture that would get underneath the windowsill has a way to get out. You'll have that over the lintels. So for example, if I go back to here, if this is a, a long opening, there'll be a vent hole over here because if any moisture gets behind here, it'll have a way to get out, right? So uh, you'll see like if it's a wide opening, every third brick would have a vent hole in it over the, the windows and under the sills. So take a look at that when you're, when you're um, looking around at some of the different uh, brickwork that you see on uh, buildings and houses. And of course, it, as we've discussed before, you know, in your construction notes in a drawing, it will say something like that. It will say that you've got uh, your brick veneer construction, face brick, 25 millimeters, airspace, right? So that's straight from the building code. You don't know what size bricks, so they're telling you three or four inch wide brick. Most of them today are three inch. The older bricks, the Ontario size and other older style bricks are four inch. The traditional way was a brick was um, if it was eight inches long, then it was four inches wide minus the joint size. So that then if you put two headers together plus a joint, it would be exactly the length of a brick. That way they could do lots of those different bonds that I talked about earlier. But over time, they looked at economics and they saw, well, you know what? We can make this brick 40, 50% bigger and we can make it a little bit narrower, use less material, make it not as heavy and it won't take a brick layer any longer to do it. So now, instead of uh, being able to lay, let's just throw out a number, 200 square feet of brick a day, now a brick layer could lay out lay two, 260 or 280 and not take any more effort. And that would drastically reduce costs. So there's some productivity and efficiency calculations that have been built in over time with that. You get too big at a certain point, then it gets too awkward. And then, you know, there's there's more issues. So they kind of have this sort of zone that they found, almost like if you ever look up Taylorism, which is sort of the scientific management of how we um, do things. And Taylorism has its own set of issues. I could go on about that. But uh, the the idea, though, is looking at where where's the optimum zone. And so same thing with scaffolding, they'll put scaffolding on one side of the building and do the scaffolding on that one side of the building and uh, then uh, have it toothed out and then they'll do the other side of the building, right? So they'll do the scaffolding on one side and then they'll have it toothed out and then they'll move the scaffolding like they have here and now they'll start filling this in. You have to make sure if you're managing that process that the bricklayers are tucking a lot of mortar in the upper part. Sometimes they get a little bit lazy and they don't tuck enough in and that forms a weak spot and that can cause uh, moisture problems and uh, deterioration problems later. Here's windows that are installed. They are installed ahead of time and they are left protruding. So they protrude outward. Uh, and there is an airspace, so uh, not airspace, but a space left around the window so that then polyurethane foam will be foamed in to ensure there's no gaps around that window surface. You can see the shims, the shims are the adjusting. We've talked about that in the framing lectures in the previous lectures. If you go back and look at them, if you forgot, uh, that wood expands, contracts, warps, twists, and so we want to have a little bit of extra space and I recommend about a half an inch on each edge. So if this is two foot, I'd want to have two foot one. If this is five foot, I'd want to have five foot one in my rough opening. That way I can shim it perfectly plumb and plumb is vertical and level is horizontal. And then we'll foam it and this is sticking out so that when I put the brick, it'll reach, it'll span that airspace and the brick will go against it and then it can be cocked. You can also see up above here, the framing was left out on the second floor. So this is in Collingwood, Ontario. And uh, this particular house, it's a more rural kind of uh, country kind of feel to it. So um, architectural control in that area, they don't want just brick typically, they'll usually want to mix. And so the second story of this house has some um, uh, siding that looks like traditional siding. It's a manufactured siding, but it'll give a very sort of um, country look to um, the 
neighborhood that's being built, it's production homes, right? And they've got an extruded polystyrene uh, foam board on the outside, which will add R5 to the wall and typical resistance to heat loss and will help act as a thermal break between the framing and uh, the outside, which helps to slow heat loss through the structure and through the envelope. So there's a little bit of a close up so you can see the shims and you can see the space and this will be foamed before the brickwork gets done. And there's that part that sticks out so that when the brick comes up, then they put the siding on, it'll be a nice smooth transition between the second floor and the first floor. So again, a little bit of in the details of how that's framed then to cantilever this portion of the second floor outward. You can see the ledge barely uh, there that the brick will sit on. So the brick's gonna sit on that concrete ledge there with a one inch airspace. Siding materials, so that's kind of our talk on brick, but a lot of other different materials. You can Google uh, exterior siding. There is a lot of different uh, composite materials that are really wonderful these days, um, much better than even just regular vinyl siding, the traditional kind of uh, siding that you'll see. Uh, composite materials that look and feel like wood, but the advantage is they don't have to be painted every three, four years. Uh, they last a long, long time, and um, they can. Most of them can be painted at some point, but to be honest, they last a long, long time. So you're probably better to hold off on any of that um, for a few decades. Uh, so a lot of good materials out there, but these standard terminologies are pretty um, common. And of course, the fascia and the soffit—that's uh, all standard stuff. Uh, no matter what kind of finishes you're using on the walls. Because uh, you could use wood, but again, it's a pretty laborious um, effort. And in urban settings, certainly we typically don't do that anymore, um, or at least not frequently. I try not to say ever, because as soon as I say that, I'm wrong because somebody's doing it. Uh, so uh, a drip cap over, uh, over windows and doors, and that's just to make sure that any moisture that gets behind gets out and away from the windows. You're always concerned about intersections of different materials and uh, where it laps. And so that's our soffit, that's our fascia material. Drip cap goes over top of the windows. That really shouldn't show there, to be honest. The drip cap goes over top of the windows and doors. Here you see some uh, going around, vinyl siding being put into place, some building paper being put on. Uh, not the best with the building paper methodology. You know, today I would be looking at some sort of better weather barrier system. We'll talk about that when we talk about the building envelope. Something that would be, you know, um, like a, a spun bonded olefin, uh, Tyvek would be one company. I don't want to really endorse any one company. Blueskin would be another if we want to talk about different companies. Uh, but you want something that's breathable on the outside, but that you could seal up. Uh, that would be more, uh, more resistant to wind loads and uh, air uh, would allow air to moisture to dry to the outside of the building. The problem with this is it's it's a little bit that it doesn't really seal up for wind loads, that sort of thing, but it is pretty good for moisture. Like moisture is not gonna be the issue. Like moisture that gets behind the siding. Uh, yeah, and you can see siding materials. Uh, again, in some jurisdiction, you wouldn't be able to, legal to do this. You'd have to put up a scaffold system or better yet, they'd probably use a zoom boom where it can actually boom the person up to where they're doing the, the work and in, in safe uh, practices. Not the best to be working off ladders from that perspective. And so here we got combinations of aluminum and a vinyl uh, uh, being used. So this would be vinyl soffits, vinyl sidings. This would be likely aluminum that would be bent on site or be pre-capped. Uh, here we've got for a siding material, if you're going to use a wood type siding, uh, best to have it strapped. This is in a rural setting, as I said. Uh, and so that air flows behind the siding and moisture has a way to exit. So in this case, you definitely want to have sort of, if you're using like a solid wood, you want to have a space that allow any moisture, dampness that maybe goes into the wood to dry to the inside and dry to the outside uh, through that uh, material. So that's a best practice in that case. There's a good example of a shed dormer, gable roofs uh, in that case. There's our uh, projection or overhang if we're talking about the slope. 
a lot of different siding types uh, so you can see the methodologies that are used um, tongue and groove so that's the tongue and the groove is the groove um, board and batten type uh, materials uh, where you have boards go together and you got a batten that goes over top some of the vinyl sidings and others give that emulation or that look to it um, because of tradition uh, bevel siding different methodologies but however the sidings put you should always be thinking about how moisture flows right and that it shouldn't be able to get up and in behind or in infiltrate into the building very easily that's always a hallmark of thinking about these systems we also have our traditional stucco method on the outside where we would put a portland cement based uh, um, coating that would be done on a wire mesh uh, galvanized wire mesh and so um, the traditional way of doing it was that you'd troweled this on in three coats and uh, first you'd have what they called the scratch coat which, which would get roughly straight then you'd have um, basically the um, brown coat which would level it out be all flat and then you'd have some sort of finished coat which would be whatever color you wanted in the mix and that'd be troweled on top of that problem with the traditional method it would tend to crack because it's kind of more brittle uh, so over time it would tend to um, crack you could put in expansion joints and you should put in expansion joints like at the floor levels and about every 10 or 12 feet in length uh, but still it was pretty rigid uh, material so we came up with this exterior um, insulated finish system or EFS uh, as it's better known and a very popular system in some locations uh, so EFS is a, a pretty good uh, material that way there's a number of different manufacturers uh, you have to make sure you follow their system requirements uh, traditionally when EFS first came out caused a lot of problems so if you're in British Columbia you probably already know about the, the problems it caused. Well, British Columbia gets, especially the Vancouver area, gets a lot of rain. It's a marine climate. Uh, you know, it rains every day or every other day. It seems when I go there, it doesn't rain though. But anyways, uh, and uh, moisture gets behind and it doesn't get a chance to dry out. So initially they had what they called a perfect barrier system where they'd have it sealed everywhere. Uh, and uh, that's the idea. You'd seal it perfectly. There's no such thing as a perfect barrier system. If you did get it perfect right then, heat loads, expansion, contraction, you're going to get openings, moisture is going to get in. So like the brick veneer we talked about, if it gets in, you want it to be able to dry out, and then that's okay. So what they came up with was a drainage layer that allowed the moisture to um, drain out. And so in the, uh, again, it depends on the manufacturer, how they've designed it, but there has to be, um, some form of uh, drainage uh, layer between the styrofoam and between the wall all right so instead of having it flat on the wall there has to be some way and then it has to have some method of draining out so whoever the the manufacturer is they have to have it in that design and all the major manufacturers have that system and they've had that for quite a while now um, the association of um, architects uh, at least in Ontario you know there was such a problem that they said if you design this system without a drainage layer we're not going to insure you for those um, designs so the, mar the industry quickly changed and adapted but you see it you know it is, it is a good system if you if you look at um, George Brown College our e-building is done with an EF system uh, they'll use a heavier gauge of fiberglass when it's like commercial uh, or if you want to pay the extra in a residential because it makes it more resistant to denting and that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, it's a very good system. It has its limitations. Um, so you can read up on the limitations um, with regards to time frame and maintenance, etc. Uh, it's not necessarily a, an inexpensive system. You can get all kinds of decorative moldings to give all kinds of different looks to it. So that's EFS. Uh, and that would be what I wanted to cover in lecture uh, 6A, and we'll be returning with 6B, which we'll start to look at concrete. So hopefully that's giving you a good idea of how our materials work and how they're applied to the exterior of the building. How they're, We'll get into a little bit more how we show it on the drawings as well in an upcoming lecture. And if you look at 5C, I also talk about the, the brick and the arches and that sort of thing in that lecture on the brook drawings. So I'm Tom Stevenson, hoping you have a wonderful day, 
and signing off for now. We'll see you next time.